Hey everyone, you're listening to the Active Turnkey Podcast, a podcast designed for hands-off, passive real estate rental investors. In the Active Turnkey Podcast, you'll hear Tom Olson and Jared Stoltmeister discuss all things turnkey rentals with other turnkey providers, service providers, and rental investors. Our goal is to help you reach your financial freedom and whatever comes after that. Let's go. Welcome back to the Active Turnkey Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Stoltmeister, and this is Tom Olson. Tom Olson. This is me. Again, he's with us, joining us in his podcast. <laughs> uh, so thank you for joining us there. Uh, so today... Oh, no, no, Jared. This is all your podcast. It's mine. The Active Turnkey Podcast. I think the next episode, it might be just you, actually. It could be. And I'm going to I'm gonna take it. I mean, I, I think it. that the next episode is going to be like off the charts. It's going to be the one that... It's the tipping point for this Active Turnkey Podcast that makes us... You know, into the mm-hmm. stratosphere of like millions of downloads. I, I, I can agree. just I couldn't agree more. I, I agree can more. just sense it. I can feel <laughs> it. It's going to happen. Oh yeah, it's going to be big. And so I mean, it's, it's going to be huge. It's kind of a teaser. It'll be really. epic. It's definitely. You will not want to miss next <laughs> week's podcast. There you go, boy. He's he's good at this. He's he's done a couple of these podcasts before, I think. <laughs> so uh, so yeah. So we're back in the podcast, and today we're talking about kind of something that's not the most fun, or something you as an investor you don't want to hear. When Are you talk kidding? To rentals. I don't want oh, to. Oh, I was excited. I thought today was a fun podcast. No, no, no. So actually, Stink. I am an investor. I have properties in my portfolio, and I am going through this situation for the first time right now. Oh, it Jared. is. Evictions. Do you need somebody to hold your hand? Do you need a, a shoulder to cry on? I do. It's it's it's. So I I I have six properties now myself, and I'm going through my first eviction right now. Okay. And so, so now you can actually, after this process, you'll be able to really know what identify. a real investor feels like. Yep. At this point, it's been Because this is amazing. what the real part of invest- <laughs> investing is, you know? Yeah. You know, we get those first couple of properties and we think everything's going to go perfect. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's just going to be just peachy keen. And, and, and we, we, we're looking at the performa mm-hmm. and we're looking at our numbers. And we're like, wow, we're actually better than our mm-hmm. numbers. And then the eviction happens. The eviction happens. Yeah. So I've actually been able to tell people I've been investing for about three years now in rentals and, and, uh, I've been telling people, Hey, you know, I've never had an eviction, you know, cause it's apparently it's something that I did right. Of course. Right. I chose the right house and all that stuff. Right. Or the right property manager. Or, or, well, sure. That's case in point for sure. But, <laughs> but yeah, now I can no longer say that. And so I get to learn a little bit from that side, but yeah, that's what today's is about. It's about evictions and it's not something people like it's, it's, it's probably the, the worst part maybe to, to the rental side. Well, there's two cut, there's two types of evictions. And I actually just had this conversation yesterday with an investor. Um, The first kind of eviction is when you take over a property and somebody's been living in the property for like the last two or three years Mm -hmm. for free. Mm -hmm. And they just kind of have gotten used to it. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it doesn't matter how hard you try, you know, like, like you, you go to all these gurus and you see all these um, people speak on the stage and this is what I do. I go in there and I ask them to start paying rent and they just start paying me rent. Sure. No, I mean, I, I, and I, I told the lady I was talking yeah. to yesterday that yeah. I've had a big zero when mm-hmm. it comes, and we've tried that yeah. every time, yeah. every time when we yeah. take over a property that's already rented. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not from a turnkey provider, not something that was actually already rented. Right. Um, I mean, sure, there, there have been several, like we took over a whole package and out of the whole package of say 37 units, I think we actually had 28 of those actually sign a new lease with us and mm-hmm. move forward. Mm-hmm. But we did have some evictions out of those. So I'm not talking about that. Um, but I'm talking about like you just buy a house that mm-hmm. you know um, the person hasn't been paying for, for, for who knows how long. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe you buy it at a tax sale. Right. Um, and sheriff that, that, sale was one Sheriff of them. sale. Yeah. I mean, every single time we've bought a property on tax sale, sheriff sale, um, any kind of uh, foreclosure that the tenant was in, mm-hmm. we go back to the tenants and we say, or the people that are living there and say, mm-hmm. hey, like we own this property now. If you want to rent it from us, you absolutely can. But this is our guidelines. You mm-hmm. have to you have to be able to pay for it. <laughs> you have to be able to qualify for it, just mm-hmm. like everybody else would have to qualify from right. our different standards. and. Mm-hmm. Different things lean different ways. You know, I really like to see a 600 credit score. I really like to see um, job history. I really like to see no mm-hmm. judgments. And, you know, but all those mm-hmm. things kind of come together. Maybe they have less than 600 credit score, but they've never had a judgment or mm-hmm. they're younger or something else that kind of helps us, you know, put them over the over the top to be able to keep them in the property. As long as they qualify, I try to get them sure. in. But every single time what's happened for us is yeah. Yeah. zero. Like they don't want to actually pay. 
And for some reason, that is the number one reason to, for evict, right? I mean, the number one reason that you've experienced or you've seen and I've seen is that people just don't pay. And Correct. for some reason, when you are renting something and you don't pay, like the owner of that something, doesn't matter if it's a house or if it's a machine or a car, um, expects for you to pay. Yes. And if you don't pay, then... Um, like you don't have the rights because you're basically borrowing sure. the rights. You're bar you're you're paying money so you can mm -hmm. borrow the rights to be able to have or live mm -hmm. in this property. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, that's probably the number one reason to evict, and that is probably what ends up happening with us sure. as well on the back end. So we place a tenant, and we have a pretty good history. Mm -hmm. Um, I think out of the first 100 um, tenants that we place with our own criteria, I think we've only had to evict one of those tenants. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a I think that's a good number. Sure. I mean, I'm I'm pretty happy with that number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, Jared, you, 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 so, you can get started. So you kind of touched on it and I'm, I'm going to go there today. So just this week, um, in the news, if you guys have been following the news, you see in Seattle that uh, the Seattle city council passed a moratorium on evictions, uh, during the winter months, meaning you cannot evict a tenant from December one through March one. It's got to go through some things. I guess from what I what I listened to from the news out there that it, the mayor was going to probably veto it, but they had enough votes, two third votes, for it to carry through. So in that case, December one to March one. Uh, so where are you at on this, Tom? Are you for or against this moratorium? Are you? Uh, yeah. Uh, I honestly, they've been doing this. I believe in Crook. I mean, Cook County, oh. Illinois. For I don't mm -hmm. think it's been quite December to March. I believe it's just December and January. Mm -hmm. um, I think December to March is excessive to like no end. Absolutely. I mean, four whole months. I mean, what what incentive is there for them mm -hmm. to actually pay during mm -hmm. those four months? Mm -hmm. Then I mean, really, like any tenant could go out into Seattle right. and just like pay for eight months out of the year right. and then get four months free and then just move on if they want mm -hmm. to. I mean, mm -hmm. like it, I, I, it just doesn't make any sense at all. Right. And um, the, the, the people that would come up with such a thing either are trying to appease cronies or to mm -hmm. buy votes. I mean, that's, that's really mm -hmm. the only, the only thing that you can. And like, of course now with the, that, or the only reason why that would make sense to vote for that is that you're trying to buy votes sure. yeah. or totally. you're, you're paying off some cronies or somebody mm -hmm. has, mm -hmm. Has given you money that yeah. will that will say, hey, if you give me this, if, if, if I give you this money, will you vote this way? Like it, it's just you're you're either paying for the votes or mm -hmm. the 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 politician is is doing something to get more votes. That's it. So so from watching the news and kind of following the story uh, from you know a few thousand miles away or whatever, uh, it sounds like the counter to this would be to raise rent dramatically. Oh, to cover that. It absolutely will happen. For I mean, at the end of the day, whenever. Whenever and, and this is why we go to Washington at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, mm -hmm. and we go and talk to the politicians and say, "Hey, like, this might have been good. You might have thought that there's something good that's that's mm -hmm. in this, and mm -hmm. you might help some people, but like for the two or three people that's going to help, it's actually going to screw over five or six other people. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's what this is going to do. This this really just is not. I mean, it's it's it it doesn't make any sense. It's right. it's basically like saying like if I can rack up my credit card, I don't have to pay for it. I mean. Sure. Um, I mean, in addition to this, right now, I just looked, you know, read, read an article this morning, posted on Facebook, I think, as well, about, um, you know, forgiveness of $203 billion worth of student loan debt. It's the exact same yeah. concept. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you can't just rack up and then expect not to have to pay. Mm -hmm. I mean, at some point, you have to pay. And and I and I and I I'm not saying I'm against debt. I'm not against all this 100%. But you have to figure out how to how to end up paying for what you said that you're going to pay for at some right. point. Yeah, it, and so I, it, as we were approaching this podcast, I thought that was really interesting. The timing, um, it just came out this week, so uh, definitely something to pay attention to. And and uh, I know uh, in one city in Indiana. That has been an issue in South Bend, mm -hmm. I believe, uh, where it's just that one city from from what I understand. Um, but uh, we have some people in our network who, who are out there in South Bend and have talked about those issues. Um, and some people trying to push for things. So if that time ever comes, for those of you who invest with us, we would certainly get that information out to you guys and, and have you talk to our representatives for the state. Let's hope it doesn't happen in our area. Who, mm -hmm, who's who's mm -hmm. to say that it will or won't? Mm -hmm, but. Mm -hmm. Um, I, it's definitely something to to be Absolutely. mindful about. Absolutely. So we transition, and you kind of touched on it. So we just want to touch on first of all, if you're going through this, uh, what what are some reasons that there would be an eviction? And you touched on it. The first and foremost, they're just not paying their rent, mm -hmm. right? First and foremost, Absolutely. and it's probably by far. Oh yeah. Um, the number one reason. It's not like it's first place, and it's like 
30 percent is probably first place in maybe 80 90 percent right, of, yeah. of the evictions that happen um and, and i think evic- the eviction process i actually believe is a check and balance you know because if you go through an eviction process properly you're going to have a judge that's going to be able to say whether mm-hmm. or not the landlord is doing there's so- something right or wrong and where the tenant's doing something that's right or wrong and if the tenant's not paying or the tenant doesn't show up to the court or whatever like the mm-hmm. judge is normally going to um side with a landlord now if the, uh, the, 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 if the tenant comes and says, well, no, I actually did pay and here's the receipt or, mm-hmm. you know, they, mm-hmm. they refuse my payment or, um, you know, the, the property is inhabitable and this is a proof of the, why the property mm-hmm. is inhabitable, mm-hmm. then it may be a whole different story. Um, but really like not paying the rent is the number one key reason why somebody should, sh- and actually really should be evicted. Absolutely. And so, uh, so today's podcast won't be long, but I mean, that point is the main is the main point, but we have a couple other ones. Second one would be just damage to property, uh, and uh, so you you, you just kind of have that where someone's doing that and they and they don't want to pay for it or they're continually doing damage to the property, mm-hmm. and and it could be in many forms. Uh, that could be uh, like for us, I was talking to our property manager Cheryl this morning, and and we have uh, that they, they can be fined if they're smoking inside uh, like certain a, properties. A week, yeah, we can give them a five hundred dollar penalty for that, or there's a penalty for. For pets, if they don't uh, if they don't disclose that they have a pet and have the pet fee and, and the and the pet registration, and you come to find out there's a pet there and they and they don't want to adhere to the to the standard, then mm-hmm. they that's another reason why you could evict. So so you know your damage to the property, um, and the next one is probably probably number two on the list is just not abiding by the terms of the lease. Uh, so, uh, you know, I kind of touched on the, the, the pet registration and, and things like that. There are certain guidelines that or they just have Or extra people to... being in the property. I mean, Absolutely. If, if we find out there's 12, 14 people in a two or three bedroom house, I mean, it, that's not going to work for us. Sorry. Right, right. Yeah. And, and of course, these are things that they sign. So, and now that's something you want to touch base with your property manager. I know uh, in talking with, uh, in preparation for this podcast, talking with our property manager, uh, she went through the details and, and how, how you have to go through line by line, initialing everything and making sure that that tenant fully understands all the expectations that's in the, uh, that's in the lease. And so, so yeah, not abiding by the terms of the lease. And I think a lot of that's uh, self-explanatory, but uh, you, you might want to follow up with your leases and your property managers on stuff like that too, to make sure that that's being followed. And then the last one is just uh, kind of like an other or miscellaneous type thing where uh, cleanliness standards, you can say hoarders possibly. You know, people. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, you know, what the funniest thing to me is sometimes like we will get this, like, um, It'll go to eviction and it'll be like, there's mold in the property. And we, mm-hmm. when we actually go and investigate, we're like, yeah. well, if there's mold in the property, we want to make sure that we take mm-hmm. care of that. So mm-hmm. we go look at it and, oh, lo and behold, there's mold in the bathroom because it hasn't been washed. It hasn't been cleaned one time since the mm-hmm. person pro- probably moved in the property. Mm-hmm. That's the responsibility of the tenant to right. actually right. clean and wash the, 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 the shower. Mm-hmm. And if they're not making it, I mean, my wife actually used to work in the cleaning industry and she used to run a cleaning company. And um, pink mold is probably... an 99.9999% of all houses and people, we don't realize it, mm-hmm. but it's because like it grows in showers and it grows like the very first time you do a shower. So don't think that you can shower and then never wash the actual mm-hmm. walls with bleach or with some kind of a solvent mm-hmm. that's going to actually kill antimicrobial that, that's going to kill that. You can't just continue to do that. It builds up over time. And then mm-hmm. what ends up happening is, um, of other mold starts growing on top of the paint mold. So, um, mold will grow in three days. Mm. Um, and you know, it doesn't take much mm-hmm. for, for mm-hmm. that to grow. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, you know, and that, that's a big deal, like making sure that things stay wiped down in the properties, right. you know, and if, if we find out if, if it's a one-time problem, okay, like sure. we're, we're always willing to give grace and you probably should think about that. But mm-hmm. again, like the number one overwhelming reason to evict is them just not paying. Right. Um, I think, the, I think the second biggest reason is if they're damaging the property mm-hmm. or if there's something like they have a big dog and they didn't disclose mm-hmm. it and the dog's making a mess, mm-hmm. um, you know, or if they're stealing something from the property, mm-hmm. but overwhelmingly sure. the number one reason would be for them not to pay rent. Um, and we, we inspect all of our properties once a quarter mm-hmm. and I think it's once a quarter, maybe mm-hmm. once every six months, one mm-hmm. or the other, but, mm-hmm. um, and just, you know, it's great to do those inspections cause you can kind of find out some of these other things and you really want your properties to stay in good shape. Mm-hmm. So having somebody in those properties every quarter, every six months is a great idea if you're not already doing that. And yeah, you're not going to find out otherwise if you're yeah. not doing that. I mean, Absolutely. how else are you going to find out that the house mm-hmm. is a mess uh, um, and the disaster in there? And and I don't think you guys realized uh, today in listening to this podcast that you would kind of get cleaning tips from Tom. Oh, sorry. But he was just, just <laughs> in game. Cleaning I tips. think he's been waiting in our yes, podcast. Yes, yes. Oh, that, that was it, Jared. To disclose his cleaning 
I don't know, whatever you call it. You know, I figured, you know, (laughs) these podcasts need to be a little bit more funny. Sure. So maybe we should, like, add a little extra humor in this. And you went the cleaning direction. Yes. Okay. okay. Got it. <laughs> that makes sense. And so I mean, there's always an opportunity. Yes. And he and and he took yes. it full. I'm advantage. like Jared. I laugh at my own jokes. <laughs> yeah. I laugh at yeah totally. And I always say if I'm laughing, it's funny. Yes. So, it must be. Uh, that's the line. Now the last thing I would say as far, uh, going back is um, for like the elder miscellaneous is you know mis- municipality violations. So one of our things is taking care of the lawn. Yep. Or you can't just store five vehicles in your in the grass in the front of the lawn. Those are things you can't do. And if they don't move those vehicles, there's a couple of country songs that come to mind when you say that. Jared. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, I don't know them at this point. <laughs> uh, All right. Again, uh, so anyway, uh, but I mean, those are reasons, right? That that yep. you would that the twelve you, days of Christmas, the redneck twelve days of Christmas. Yeah. Um, no, it's not coming I'm to not, mind. I'm not big. All right. All right. All right. It's not my thing. All right. Uh, Look it up, Jeff Foxworthy. 12 Days of Christmas. Okay. All right. It's on your favorites, I'm sure. Yes, All of you definitely. out there. <laughs> Just dart right up. Let's stay here to the end. And then you can go check out Jeff right. Foxworthy's <laughs> podcast or uh, whatever on YouTube. So, so yeah, uh, so those are things that you know, typically you would find uh, when you're talking about the uh, getting eviction. So, so now today we're going to take just a few minutes and just go through the process. And I think it's really important for you to know what happens uh, step by step with your property manager and how they evict. And so uh, it is It is processed, it is systemized, and you probably want to maybe ask your property manager, hey, do you have a process for evictions and how do you do it? Um, and they, if they've done enough, they should be able to rattle off pretty quickly, hey, this is what we do, this is what we found is uh, best, this is cheapest, because uh, in the end, in some cases, you may incur some cost for that. So you want to know that, hey, are they doing a good job? Uh, and so we actually had a meeting this week where we realized it's cheaper for us to allow our attorney to go to the county uh, to do that for us. Uh, because of the cost, it makes more sense, uh, and so um, stuff like that. But but uh, before we get moving into that, did you have any other comments from what you discussed? I love processes, Jared. It gets some. Excitement. Are we going to draw some maps and stuff? We are not. No, no map drawing. We today? Are, okay. No. Uh, yeah, Tom always gets like this, and I try. That's oh, why we usually don't talk man. about processes in our podcast because it's Stink. Just, he turns into a different person. Can, can I just draw a map over here on, on my paper while yeah. we're doing so this, Jared? If Tom can draw, I'll, I'll move into this part and Tom can do his thing. And maybe at the end, you'll get to see a pretty picture. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. So, okay. I can find a pen there. Is okay. There, is there a pen around All right. Here? Well, you keep on looking. Oh, and, uh, All right. Well, uh, no pen. So, uh, can't draw pretty pictures. So, so, this next part is what needs to happen when time to evict? What's the process? And so, you know, Tom, you can jump in. We have the notes right in front of me, but but uh, if you want to take the next step, but absolutely, but, I'll uh, take it. So, go ahead. I think the first thing to know is that you do need to have like these stopping points. You you need mm-hmm. to have triggers. Mm-hmm. Um, and and mm-hmm. in, in any process map, if you like, have ever done a Kaizen event, you had to go back to the kind process. Of, thing. I told you, I love these processes. <laughs> yeah, if you've ever done any kind of a process mapping or mm-hmm. workflow, you know that like. You, you normally want triggers. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, what is the first trigger then, Jared, for, for, for an eviction? So somebody, the pay. first trigger mm-hmm. is like, mm-hmm. a, for the most part, they don't pay. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's just use that as the trigger because some of these other triggers that we talked about um, are a lot less likely. They could happen, and mm-hmm. these could happen in the middle of the month, though. Mm-hmm. So there's mm-hmm. not really like dates mm-hmm. right. that are associated where this process that we're going to talk about is more associated with if they don't pay. Correct. So when is rent due, Jared? First. Typically, the rent is due on the first. Mm-hmm. And now you're going to need to check your own state for some of these things. I'm not an attorney, and I'm, I'm only in Indiana, so we're going to kind of tell you what we do in Indiana. Mm-hmm. But I do think it applies mm-hmm. to any other state, and it, the timelines may be a little different. Sure. I do know in Indiana they have um, started uh, changing some of the laws. It used to be, I think, a five-day, and now it's at, we're at a 10-day type of um, notices. It used to be five. Like I think some states you can still do a five-day notice. I think we believe we have to do a 10-day mm-hmm. notice. Mm-hmm. So just know what your state is or the properties that you own, um, where, the, the, where the states are at. And even sometimes even the counties or cities can have little diff- different tweaks to these. So, mm-hmm. you know, for us, if rent's due on the first, mm-hmm. um, what day is it late, Jared? It's late. Well, technically, it's late on the second. Yes, Jared got it right. Ding, 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 ding. I am. I, you know, I'm I, on it. and we tell every tenant this: mm. the rent is due on the first. Mm-hmm. So that means if the rent is in our in in our location, or if it's been um, done on Buildium, mm-hmm. or if it's mm-hmm. automatically been drafted, or whatever, if it's here by the first or the thirtieth, or the mm. or the twenty ninth beforehand. Guess what? It's on time. Wow. You're a good tenant. So if you're a tenant out there and you're paying the rent on the second, 
or the third. Is that on time? No. No, because it's due on the first, <laughs> right? Correct. Okay, so I just, I just, I just want to make Sorry. sure that that's the first thing we have to understand. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you're a landlord or a tenant. Mm-hmm. If the rent is due on the first, it's due on the first, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. Now, so there's also normally a grace period, right? Sure. So what is our grace period, Jared? Uh, what is it, six? I think six? it's five days. I believe right. it's five days. Right. So that means if it's on the fifth, there is no late fee. Mm-hmm. Okay, so for some reason, I don't understand why this is, but in most people's heads, they believe, and I even think I've seen a lot of people even do this with their mortgage, which can be dangerous because if you pay your mortgage after the first, guess what? You are incurring extra interest. You may Mm. not realize it, Mm. but you actually are incurring extra interest. Um, So so pay on the first. Mm -hmm. If you pay on the first, you're a good tenant. Like you are A++. You may even get our three-star rating um, that we got from Mr. Landlord. Um, mm. So anyways, and we put that in our in our thing. So do on the first. It's late on the fifth. So that means you have a grace period of those five days. Mm-hmm. If you pay on the second, fine. If it's $1,000 rent, you pay $1,000. If you pay on the third, it's $1,000. If you pay on the fourth, which, how much do you think it is, Jared? I'm curious. $1,000. How about on the fifth? Thousand. A thousand. Mm-hmm. Now, it's late on the sixth, mm-hmm. correct? Mm-hmm. So, as soon as the sixth hits, now there is a late fee. Mm-hmm. And I know that there are lots of people out there that are going to preach and teach. You should be charging them a daily fee every single day after that. Mm-hmm. I have been to court several times, and the mm-hmm. judge has thrown those daily fees out every time. Interesting. And maybe it's just my courts or maybe it's just the judges or maybe it was our lease that our attorney wrote that didn't quite Mm -hmm. make it. But so we have learned that the maximum in Indiana, for instance, that I can charge for a late fee, I believe is 10%. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we actually charge 10%. Mm -hmm. I believe we charge $50, which Mm -hmm. is 5%. Mm -hmm. So if it's late on the, um, on the sixth, then the the tenant owes an additional $50. Right. Now, is that a bad thing? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Mm-hmm. Great answer. It's the exact answer I would have given. <laughs> In fact, I have been a property manager before I started this property management company here. I was a property manager for about 12 years. And I got up. To, I was up to managing about 40 properties on my own, on the side, in, in, in along with like working full time for a guy and also having my own side business mm-hmm. for many years. And um, I had a tenant that had been in the property for eight years. And I don't think one month he paid on time. Mm. And one, I'm not even sure, one month in that eight years, they they paid within the five-day grace period. But for some reason, somehow they always came up with a payment by about the 15th. Mm. And I went through and I told the guy after about six years of this, do you realize mm. that you have paid X, and I forgot how much it was. It was like $2,800. It was a crazy amount of mm. late fees. I'm like, do you realize that you've paid this? If you would have just paid on time, you probably have enough money to save up to put a down payment and buy a house. Mm-hmm. And um, But so for me, if I'm a landlord and my tenant is com- is constantly late, I don't really have a bit, I don't sure. care. I really sure. don't care. Mm-hmm. However, we're still going to run the same process, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, so the process for us, and, and again, every state's different. We've tweaked ours a little bit. I believe on the sixth of the month it used to be, and it looks like now it might be the ninth of the month. Um, and I'm not quite sure if that's just changed recently, Jared, mm-hmm. um, or not. But but for me, I would always send out 10-day eviction letters on the 6th. Now, So I believe what's happening at this point now is that we are calling them. We're trying to get a hold mm-hmm. of them and say, hey, mm-hmm. your payment's late. You do have a uh, late fee. We mm-hmm. need to get this paid as soon as possible, or we are going to give you uh, you know, a late notice. Mm-hmm. So then for us, it looks like we're giving them an extra three days before we actually, you know, post th- this letter. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, so for us, I think the process is then on the ninth of the month, a 10 day letter gets put on their door. Mm-hmm. And I believe in most states, and I think it's the way in our, in our state still, you have to, you, I would recommend you take a picture of that notice that you post on the door or mm-hmm. you have a picture of giving it to them or whatever, because mm-hmm. you do need proof that it was actually given to mm-hmm. to the party that mm-hmm. you're saying you're giving it. So normally we'll bring duct tape or we'll bring tape or whatever and post on the front door mm-hmm. and then take a picture of it and it has the address there and we can always put it back in a building and show, hey, we posted this and this was this is what's going on. Now to piggyback on that for us, you mentioned Buildium. Uh, one thing then talking with the property manager, they do email them as well at the same time. The owner. So the owner, okay. uh, well, the, they email the tenant, tenant. the property okay. management emails them. So it is in their file and they can say that it was done as well mm-hmm. uh, they that's can true. argue that's good. so uh that's so that there it's it's kind of a two-pronged thing that they go through that, so that, yeah that, 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 that's a great point and i will tell you it when any with when you're doing anything in property management now the 
the more you can document, even mm-hmm. if you're just document a conversation, mm-hmm. even if you just say on this date, this person said this and we said this and this happened, mm-hmm. the more you can document, the better. And mm-hmm. we're getting better and better and better at this. Mm-hmm. Um, every conversation that you have, if you're a landlord or, or your property manager, if every conversation, you should try to document that. Mm-hmm. And that's why great software like Podio or not Podio, but Buildium mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. Um, at Folio or some of those other you know property management softwares can be really good to help you document all those and have them in their files, basically, so to speak. So the next step, Jared, we, it looks like we reach out to the owner mm-hmm. to approve the eviction. So, you know, again, like, we never want to do something that the owner wouldn't want to do. Mm-hmm. Occasionally, some of our owners might say, hey, this person's been in there for two years. They've paid faithfully. Maybe we need to give them a little bit of extra grace period before we actually go and file. Right. Um, so, but, you know, it's my intention. And if it's my property, they're reaching out to me, which has happened several times. Mm-hmm. Um, I, there, I, I have never had a case in which I can tell you that I said, no, let's mm-hmm. not evict them. Mm-hmm. I would just say, nope, mm-hmm. send, it, send it to the attorney. Um, as soon as, if they don't pay by the, I guess it would be the 19th at this date. And I think we do it on the 9th because it doesn't really matter if we did it on the 6th or the, or the 9th. Um, I think the way that our courts run, like courts on the 24th or 25th or 26th, I could be wrong about that. So mm-hmm. I, I, what I'm just saying is I don't think it really matters of when we're going to get in court, when they would get out, um, whether it's the 6th or the 9th. And that gives us an extra time to kind of reach out to the tenant or reach out to the owner. Mm-hmm. So, we, um, so we, re- we reach out to the owner. Right, Jared? Mm-hmm. After the owner says yes, if they don't pay by this date, let's evict them. Um, then, now let me let me ask you a quick question. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you you mentioned uh, you know reach out to we have reach out to the owner for to approve an eviction, and you had mentioned there's not a situation you can remember. Uh, is there a time where maybe time of year should be accountable, or I mean, be taken into account uh, as far as you know? Hey, it's it's uh, December, uh, and you know I, I would prefer not to have a vacancy through in the middle of, at the end of December or in, into January, the you know, more difficult times to place a tenant, do repairs, et cetera. Is that something you would entertain? I'm gonna probably sound like a really mean person here, but from the landlord's perspective, no. Okay. From a tenant's perspective, I can totally understand that. Mm-hmm. And I can see, okay, but, the, but you, what you have to understand is February, March may be the absolute best time to right. have a vacancy to be able to rent it. True. So, I mean, the longer you wait, the more you're going to not have that opportunity to have the properties available at the best possible time. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, do I really want to kick people out in December, January? Absolutely not. Like that's Mm -hmm. not what, what we want to do. That's not like our intention, but I think if they're, if they don't pay in December, so let me give December as an example. If they don't pay in December and Christmas and holidays happen in December, what chance do you think they have of being able to pay in in January? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's even less of a chance they're gonna pay in January Mm -hmm. than if in December. Now, I mean, I do know of cases where maybe they didn't make the January, or maybe they're a little bit extra late in January, but they do get caught up. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing for me is when I'm dealing with a tenant is communication. Are they communicating with me? If they can't pay, are they willing to come in and pay something today or something tomorrow? Maybe they can't pay the whole $1,200, but if they can come in and pay $600 today, and Mm -hmm. it's just an issue, I personally am probably willing to work through that, but I need them to bring in something today. Mm -hmm. And it can't be like $200, it needs to be like, 50% 50% or more of the actual rent. And now mm-hmm. I will tell you, if you do this, you are running down a trail that could right. hurt you in the long run because now you have just pushed on, pushed mm-hmm. that date back in which where you could. So you're probably giving them a whole extra month if mm-hmm. they are right. about ready to screw you over. Mm-hmm. So, you, I mean, you have to do, you do have to understand that you are taking a risk by doing that. Mm-hmm. But again, if they've been great tenants and they've been a good tenant for you for two years and they've paid 24 months, maybe I'd be willing to, right. to entertain that. But I'm telling you, if it's happening December 1st, it ain't going to get any better in January 1st. I will tell you, if it's if it if they pay on time in December and all of a sudden in January there's an issue, that's very normal. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, you know, so like against working through people right then, and there are times in which people will get their tax returns in February, March, and maybe they'll get behind and maybe they'll they'll get caught up. I just don't believe as a normal process that that's how you should manage your properties as a property mm-hmm. manager mm-hmm. or as a as a as a, um, a landlord, you know, so like, are there exceptions? Probably, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But I do think that the letter of the law, the standard process should not be that such. Well, that's good. That's good. Uh, so we talked about when we send out the eviction letter, uh, then we reach out to the to the owner uh, to get approval. Uh, and again, I mean, I think there's communication um, in that case. Uh, and the next, uh, the approval from the owner, then it goes to the attorney. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the attorney gets involved. And this is the step we talked about where uh, you can do this stuff on your own. Mm -hmm. There are certain portions you can do. Uh, and if you have one property, this may be something you can handle just fine. Um, if you have multiple properties or you're a busy person, then this could start to get but out of hand. But just filing the eviction, if you have a, an mm -hmm. attorney, there are several attorneys in every county, every city that are used to doing this. Mm -hmm. So if you go and find those attorneys, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's filing so many of them that they're not going to charge you a lot of money. Right. And that's kind of what we found out. Like mm -hmm. the actual court costs us $99 mm -hmm. and the attorney ca charges us like 25 bucks yeah. or something. It's yeah. not worth it for us, you know, to be able to mm -hmm. go down to the county and do all that. It's right. just not worth it. So, so, um, you know, I, now every county's gonna be a little, and that's just the file. Right. That's not to Correct. represent you in court. Correct. That's not to necessarily go after judgments. If, mm -hmm. if they, if they, if their security deposit doesn't cover, um, all the damages mm -hmm. or lost mm -hmm. rent or whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. Um, however, uh, but you know, I you just know what, and, and try to find those attorneys that specialize or have Absolutely. at least some kind of a niche in real estate or mm -hmm. they specialize in evictions or they specialize mm -hmm. in this type of activity. And there are guys who are really good at what they do and they yep. will be in their market. And, and this is the case. There's at least four guys in, in our market that mm -hmm. I feel very comfortable. I could go to now. It just so happens that we use the same attorney that owns our title company. Mm -hmm. And it's just cause we use him for pretty much everything else. And he's mm -hmm. great and he's, and he's, he's on the ball. So yeah. Um, again, there, but there's at least three other attorneys that I can, I could name. I'm not going to name in this podcast, but I could name in Lake County, Indiana, for instance, that I would say, Hey, these guys are all mm -hmm. reputable. Mm -hmm. They, they do this for a living and they probably have a great process to be able to help you, mm -hmm. you know, with this. So, um, after sending the attorney, the attorney goes to County and he sets the court date. Now mm -hmm. this is the, this is one of the big, uh, dominoes. Mm -hmm. that gets this piece going. So yep. uh, obviously there's been a lot of stuff that's happening as far as time, um, but this is the big one. He's going to set the court date uh, now, and, and that really gets things going. Now, throughout this part of time, uh, the tenant, you may, you've been communicating with your tenant most likely throughout this process. Or the property manager. Uh, Ron, forgive me. Correct. Yes, the property manager has been communicating. You don't want to do that if you have a property manager. Uh, so now if there's a payment plan established, now that kind of changes things where they say, hey, I'm going to bring in money by such and such date. And this has happened in, in our experience mm -hmm. where we, no matter what happens though, you want to start the clock. Mm -hmm. That's where putting a 10 day letter and getting a hold of your attorney. So at least the clock is started. And now you can still communicate with your tenants as far as your property manager communicating. And then if they come up with an agreement and you're saying, hey, we want to have this and also keeping in mind that, you know, they do have another payment due in the next three, two to three weeks. So mm -hmm. you're communicating with them and, uh, and plan that you set some, some agreements. If they perform great, you can pull it back, let communicate with your attorney. If, if it's broken now, the eviction will move it forward to the next steps. You got it. So with that kind of where, where I go to like, okay, if your rents, 1100 bucks can you bring in 800 bucks today mm -hmm. uh, maybe you're a little short mm -hmm. okay but mm -hmm. if you can bring in 800 bucks today or tomorrow mm -hmm. we'll sign an agreement that this 300 dollars will be due in two weeks or whatever mm -hmm. the case is mm -hmm. and in that same agreement we're also going to say and next month's payment needs to be paid on time blah 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 right. blah blah um so and you're not going to get 800 dollars if you don't ask for it exactly you have to ask mm -hmm. for it mm -hmm. and, and you have to ask for more than what you think they can bring that's good that's good, and they have to feel it. Uh, yeah, if you start negotiating at six hundred, they'll come down as I can bring in four. <laughs> so that's just the obviously the arts of negotiation. And it's funny because I, I do know that you know, for instance, our property manager didn't. I don't think she knew this when she first started. Mm -hmm. But after she got going, she started realizing that these ten day letters work. Huh. And it's like once you start saying boom, you don't pay, you're we're gonna kick you out, and there's mm -hmm. a big letter mm -hmm. with orange tape or, you know, I know some people actually like do some funny things and, and, and then they like post it on Facebook and everybody criticizes them because they're such a mean person. Um, but I mean, I don't know what's meaner. Is it meaner to post a letter saying that you're going to get evicted or is it meaner to not pay when you said you were going to pay as a tenant? Mm. I don't know. I mean, they're both pretty, pretty egregious. Egregious. <laughs> exactly. Great. Good word. Jared. Um, so um, that's, you know, you know, so all these things need to happen, and that th that ten day letter is a very key point. And then mm -hmm. the, contracting the attorney is mm -hmm. another key thing that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and like Jared said, it starts the clock. Absolutely. So now we're uh, we're we're transitioning in. Your evictions can be done. We mentioned that it can be done by an individual, but we're finding that. Uh, we like to use our attorney. He's down there a lot. And uh, especially if you have, like for us, if you're a property manager, you may be dealing with a few evictions at one time. It's just the nature of, of having a, you know, a lot of uh, people in your, uh, that you're managing. So, um, so the next thing is um, at the first hearing, so that the court date set at the first hearing, that is when they're going to set the eviction date. 
And so, um, and they will get that settled. And you'll also, well, let me back up because for us, it's, I don't think there's been a single time where we've gone to court where they didn't set an eviction date. Correct. But this is when they hear the case. Correct. So this is when they hear both sides of the I'm story. Assuming the, You're uh... assuming that the property manager <laughs> did what they're supposed to do and the, the, all the tenants, I mean, all the landlords out there mm-hmm. did what they're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. I will tell you that's not always the case. That's true. So there, will, there are times in which they do side with the tenants. And at that point in time, like you have a certain amount of time as a as a, a property owner or as a property manager mm-hmm. to um, to comply with whatever the judge says you need to do in order for, for this to be, mm-hmm. you know, maybe maybe the judge finds you in default or, sure. or, and not obeying the, the agreement of the lease or the, um, the terms of the lease. So, mm-hmm. but that's when the judge hears both sides and the judges I think are pretty fair, at mm-hmm. least from what I've seen, they're mm-hmm. pretty fair on both sides. They're not gonna put up with any crap from a tenant and they're also not going to put it with any crap from an owner. So mm-hmm. like if you come in there and you're not prepared and you don't, and you just, it's just my word against his, like chances are you're probably not going to win. Sure. I would, I would recommend case, if you are mm-hmm. a landlord and you're going to do this yourself, I would come with as many pictures as you can, as mm-hmm. many documents as you possibly can. And as much, as much, you know, that's why we love building. We can print out everything that's happened in building. We can even go back and show the judge. This is when they've been on time. This is when they've been late for the last year. And they, if they're perpetually late every mm-hmm. single month, well, mm-hmm. that doesn't probably look good for that tenant. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is these are the complaints that they've had. This is when we've we've fixed those complaints. This is when we send somebody out, and then mm-hmm. they they cursed at our by that guy that we sent out. I mean, there, there's I mean it. It's 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 amazing if you just document what what happened, and if if you're right, like the judge will see that very clearly. But if if you don't have the documentation to say mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. is what happened on these dates and this mm-hmm. is how we've documented it, it it's it's not going to be as, as as easy as. Uh, so I I do want to step in there because like you just made the assumption that totally. you're going to set the eviction, but at that time if. <laughs> They do rule in your favor, or as the property owner's favor, or the property management's favor, then they will set an eviction date at that time. And normally, at least in our counties, how long is that time? About a week, two weeks? There, from from what I'm hearing, it could be anywhere from like seven to ten days is yeah. the typical. Now, it also would depend on the situation. Uh, from speaking with the property management and just the experience working with them for our properties, um, it depends. Also, he, he uh, the judge could side. Uh, completely with the investor or the owner uh, if they feel like the tenant has been completely taking advantage of the situation and they may say no you're you're out in five days you're out in three days because mm-hmm. um, they know it's coming they know there's that they're being difficult they know they're being and especially if they're if they're disrespectful in the courtroom uh, which has happened I mean we've even had one that just <laughs> flat out lied um, he I mean he, this was one where somebody actually um, stole the, the appliances and, uh, and, and, and he's like, I didn't steal the appliances. And then all of a sudden we, you know, we, we bring in pictures. Well, this is the, these are the mm-hmm. appliances that were there before you left. And these were, this is the kitchen before you, you know, after you left. Mm-hmm. And then the judge looks at him and he's like, um, you know, <laughs> and then the guy was like, yes, I, oh. I, <laughs> I, <laughs> you, you, you're not going to get away with it if if you're going to steal stuff from somebody's houses. Oh, that's tough. And, Especially, and, you will get away with it maybe if the property manager or the landowner or uh-huh. the landlord does mm-hmm. not have properly documented stuff. So, so to answer your question, six to ten days is kind of the typical timetable mm-hmm. if it gets to that point. I think the but most if, I've seen is two weeks. Okay, sure. And there are variables uh, that that come into play. Is Christmas time? coming up you got that they that will be a variable even mm-hmm. i know we had talked about in seattle they have the december 1st to march 1st but even in our local market everyone knows they're not going to evict somebody around christmas time uh it's just something that they're, they're not going to do and i think even uh even investors can understand that um but i hope you guys are catching this theme and you guys are smarter than i am so you're catching the theme and, and really it's documentation we're seeing this over and over and over again a really good property manager who is a steward for you this documentation is so important. And so um, so anyway, moving along from that, uh, it is uh, six to 10 days for when that's set. Now, now when that happens, Jared, it's my mm-hmm. understanding, and mm-hmm. again, I have not been a part of these personally in like eight or nine years. Okay. Four, eight or nine years, sorry. Um, but at this point, um, normally you can go out as a property manager or as an owner and just go there and you know, have new locks and kick them out personally. But I don't recommend that. I recommend you pay an extra, I don't know, 50 bucks, 100 bucks or whatever, Mm -hmm. and have the bailiff actually come out and help you with that process. So normally, so I mean, just having done it, uh, you know, occasionally here and there, uh, what usually happens, you have tenants who, I mean, we've had tenants who had to be evicted and um, they handed over the keys. It was fine. We walked in, it's clean. Mm -hmm. Um, That happens. Uh, sometimes you you know they leave the house a mess, and of course now that's going to come back to, at them a little bit later. We'll discuss that. Um, 
And so, but sometimes they leave. Uh, and so in that case, you don't need the sheriff. That's and so, true. That's so, true. Uh, so that's something where, you know, you basically see if they um, follow up with what the, with what the, uh, the court said, mm -hmm. uh, if they're still in there. And this is the hard part where, you know, it's kind of sad. They got family, they got kids and you have to bring, get the sheriff, like you said, pay a hundred bucks. It's a hundred dollars here. Uh, to do that, and sometimes we've had situations where on site we had they had to leave the house and we had to change the locks and communicate a time when they had to come back and get their stuff. Um, but uh, but a lot of times we find that the tenants don't want to go through that ordeal and that embarrassment, so they do leave uh, at the time of the, the really. The it day, makes no day. sense. I mean, mm -hmm. once the courts decided on what's right. going to happen, like there mm -hmm. really is no sense, and mm -hmm. I don't think it, does, it happens very often. No. I can I just remember at least two cases in which mm -hmm. we actually had to do right. that. Um, mm -hmm. And one was actually really close here to our our property. Mm -hmm. And we, what we ended up finding was that like when we, so you might think to yourself, man, I can't believe I have to evict somebody. This is such a hard thing to be able yeah. to do to a family mm -hmm. or to an individual or mm -hmm. a person. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side of that, if they're not paying you, mm -hmm. they're probably not a good community citizen either. Mm -hmm. And on, on, honestly, I never realized that until we had this this deal really close to mm -hmm. us, really local mm -hmm. to us, mm -hmm. in which mm -hmm. after we, we yeah. evicted him, I have had at least 10 neighbors that yeah. I don't even know who these people are, but they came up to us mm -hmm. and and they thanked us for getting rid of this person because they said he was a a menace to the entire yeah. community. I, apparently, yes. he had been accused of setting things on fire, yep. threatening right. people, <laughs> hitting people, mm -hmm. and 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 just an experience and long of drugs and of just bad people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I mean, so at the end of the day, like, and I'm not going to say every single tenant that needs to get evicted is that oh, bad sure. of a person. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people just get down on their luck. Mm -hmm. I totally understand it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, this was a person that wanted to fight and wanted to bunker down and wanted to act like he could just stay. And he had been mm -hmm. living there for like three or four years for free. Um, <laughs> you know, but at the end of the day, like he doesn't have any rights to the property. Right. So, um, you know, you know, again, it, it, it sounds like a really bad thing to have to do mm -hmm. to somebody, but sometimes it can actually be one of the best things you can do for the community. That's good. Yeah. And in that case, uh, that was a property we got at a at a uh, tax sale. And so the, it was a, over a year before we could even begin the eviction, before we took con, uh, control of the property. And then you start the eviction. Then they want to come up and, and say different things. So, yeah, in this scenario, it was he was a terror to the community. Uh, and so you, you definitely can, can see that. that. That person doesn't care in most cases about their neighbor. Yep. Um, so that, that's really good. So you really hope that part. they move out, but yeah. they don't always. Yeah. And if they don't move, move out, I just recommend get the sh bailiff involved. Yes. They'll come out and mm -hmm. they'll actually, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know physically, but they will just like say, you got to go. Like They I'm, do. I'm they, they come. I mean, I, I from my experience of being on site a couple of times, they don't forcibly do it. Usually people do it on their own. They will leave. Um, and at that point, the sheriff stays on site, lets you change the locks. And then, of course, you exchange information if you don't have it already to uh, to communicate a time where they can come and get their belongings if there's anything left in the property um, civilly. Mm. <laughs> um, you and, hope civilly. Uh, right, right. And, uh, but, of course, at that time, you even then, you give them a deadline where, hey, if it's not done by this. Because at this point, your property, it, the stuff belongs to you. Um, but Something you do, do, do and I'm not sure if it's in our process or if it's written down mm -hmm. here, but mm -hmm. and we do know this as a, as a standard. Mm -hmm. Every community and every state is going to have their own little timelines for this. Mm -hmm. But if mm -hmm. you do have to physically move somebody or if a bailiff has to come and get somebody out, um, their personal property is still their personal property. Right. Right. And so typically what will happen is, like Jared said, they'll he kind of alluded to this, but I, don't, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that everybody understands this. Mm -hmm. You cannot just take their stuff. Even if they right. leave on their own, I believe there's like a 15 period of mm -hmm. a 15 day period of time in mm -hmm. which you have to allow them the time to come back and get their stuff. Right. And because the physical property, the personal property is still there. So mm -hmm. just make sure that you know the laws right. in your state when it, right. when it pertains to personal property rules. No, that's an excellent point. And uh, you don't want to learn the wrong way and cause another problem. And now you're opening another box of something. <laughs> <laughs> and again with this, document it. Go Absolutely. through, take pictures of everything yes. that was there when you came in, mm -hmm. um, when you locked the doors. Because at mm -hmm. that point, you can change the locks. Yes. But you do have to also allow them to come back in. So right. they can set a time with you or however they, you know, they do that. Um, and then you can take pictures when they leave. Mm -hmm. And then if you can, which probably doesn't normally always happen, you can actually get them to sign a piece of paper that, you know, stating that they're leaving everything at the property and that they don't want any of it, blah, blah, blah. If you have that signature, obviously it's, it's the best documentation you can have. Mm -hmm. Most people probably may or may not be willing to sign that. I'm just letting you know that if you can get that signature, 
then then at that point you can do whatever you want with that stuff. Most of the time at this point in the eviction, they've left everything behind for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, they're they're gone. They leave their their garbage or whatever stuff they they don't think they want to take to the next place. So so yeah, I know we kind of went in a little bit nitty gritty there, but this is what happens. These are the moving parts that you're dealing with when you're working with the eviction. And this is the stuff the property manager is doing on your behalf, at least a good one. Uh, and so now fast forward. So the eviction's taken place, they're out. Now, four to six weeks after this has all happened is when you have the second hearing. And the second hearing is when they basically go over the lost rent and any damages that are in there. And that, and that includes your deposit and things like that. So now they're going to evaluate the situation and a good property manager is going to bring any utility bills that have not been paid. Um, and also property condition and any kind of repairs that were needed uh, to re bring the property back up to its current state. These are all things, again, documentation that you would bring. And and, many, and we have seen where uh, the judge would would in our go in, in the uh, in the investor's favor um, to to put together another again another plan a payment plan where they can. Uh, now at this point the, the the court is involved though. So now the court's involved in the plan. You're not just left to work with this person to make sure that they pay you. So the court's involved, it goes to them, there's probably some sort of fees that go along with that. And again, we are not attorneys, so I'm not trying to give legal advice here. Mm -hmm. I just want to let you know from our experience what's kind of happened. Absolutely. J just so we can disclose that a little bit here. Sure. But um, so really th at this next point, you know, in, and again, in our state, it may be different in your state, in our state, the property manager or the landowner or landlord has 45 days to be able to get a, a, a letter mm -hmm. um, written up, typed up with, and really say, hey, this is how much you left for security deposit. This is um, how much you maybe didn't pay for rent. This mm -hmm. is what the damages were to the property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is how much either we owe you and here's the check, or this is how much we believe that you owe us. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, a lot of people leave cordially and a lot of people, you know, maybe they, maybe they, they didn't pay their last month's rent. So they're probably, you know, their, their security deposits pretty much almost gone at that mm -hmm. point. And mm -hmm. I know that different, you're going to look at it a little different way, but I'm just saying like if, when you're totaling it all up, um, you know, I would want to put the, um, the court's going to run in your favor normally more if mm -hmm. it's lost rent versus damages. So we always apply that directly to, um, the damages first mm -hmm. and then it's lost rent second. So, so, so just, you, you kind of understand that, um, because lost rent is a lot easier to collect in the court. So just, mm -hmm. so just kind of know that, mm -hmm. um, at least it, that's the way it is in, in our area. Um, and again, I'm not giving legal advice. Mm -hmm. I'm just like telling you from my experience of, of what we've experienced with us personally on my own personal properties mm -hmm. and um, with the properties that we manage. Uh, but but so 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 you know that's kind of the process of this mm -hmm. next this next stage. You do have a certain amount of time mm -hmm. in which you have to be able to you know legally give back the the tenant their portion of security deposit if they're owed any, and if they're not owed any security deposit, how much do they owe from damages? Mm -hmm. Now, one really key thing we don't want to miss that that could uh, add add up throughout this whole process is in the event of an eviction, you want to have in your lease agreement that the tenant, if there are if there is an eviction, that the tenant will pay for the attorney fees, and so th uh, that is one thing that is takes it that is added to that is when this gets this step. When they're evaluating the the condition of the property and the lost rent, it's also the attorney fees, and that'll be wrapped up into their payment plan that they put it. together. That's gone through there. So, and a good attorney, if you have a good attorney help you with your lease, he should put that in there. Correct. Yeah. So if you do, if if you go through there, you might want to ask your property manager to update their leases, uh, and uh, even if it means waiting till you re up the next lease. But getting that added in there, that is something that it, it definitely adds up and that's something you won't get back otherwise. Uh, so uh, so again, a payment plan is set into place. It is working through the attorney and the court system. There probably would be some fees that are attributed to that, but at least you're getting something back at that point. Or now, at least you're getting a judgment. Right. Now, the last thing is uh, <laughs> if, that, if that happens and they stop paying, again, you're not left to figure it out. Now they begin to garnish wages. And so then we have had that happen as well. So, so, but all that being said, it is the, you know, property manager throughout all these steps and working all these things, working on your behalf to, with attorneys and tenants and all these different things, making sure that this is all, 
helping you get that money back that you were owed throughout that whole yeah, time. Yeah, and at this point, I don't want to um, paint a rosy picture mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because at this point, a lot of tenants will declare bankruptcy. At yep. this point, a lot of tenants will try to find a yep. weasel their way out of this. Absolutely. At this point, so I, you definitely have to expect it. You don't really want to go down this path um, of somebody owing you, like if they do some major damage, you really don't want it. You don't want somebody owing you five thousand dollars or more. Really, I think mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if they owe you less than five thousand dollars, I think the chances of you getting paid some of it or all of it are are are, are, are decent. Mm-hmm. If they owe you more than five thousand dollars, I think the chances of you getting paid are slim to none. Mm-hmm. And that's just been my experience. Other people may argue with me and say that they can find other ways to do it. Um, there are other things that you can do at this point as a property owner. Just so you do know, if you do. Um, you, again, like, and it, this kind of goes to the point of, you know, do I want to, do I want to get my money, mm-hmm. which I think for me is more important, mm-hmm. or do I want to actually, um, you know, not, not, not prove a point, but do I, do I want to actually like at least make them have to pay for part of, or mm-hmm. some of this. Mm-hmm. And the only way that I know that you can do that is you can actually file a 1099 with them. And, but at that point you have to forgive their debt. So if mm-hmm. you forgive their debt, there's a debt forgiveness type of 1099 that you can mm-hmm. send. And again, you'd have to work with your accountant or attorney mm-hmm. um, to be able to make that happen. But once you file that, it's over. You don't have any more rights to that money, but then it, that will get filed with the IRS and the IRS could go after, will go after them, not could, but with that will get attached to them in the IRS. So there are other things that you can do down the road, but I, it just in our experience, if it's a small judgment, I think your chances of getting mm-hmm. something from them are, are fair. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's a large judgment, I, I'm just telling you like, you know, there's a reason why it was so bad to begin with, and normally mm-hmm. those type of people are just gonna try to find a way out. I'm not saying that they have a right to have find a way out. I'm just know at that point it's just not a good situation. And uh, and you're right. So in talking with our property manager, this is a step where people would uh, file bankruptcy. We have had situations where an attorney does not accept it. Yep, absolutely. Because they see the pattern of someone who's trying to work the system, mm-hmm. uh, and in that case, they, they they'll deny that, and then now they have to pay it back or pay something back. Uh, or at least it's so, a judgment that still right, sits on them for right. for at least ten, 10 years, years. Mm-hmm. and um, you know it's it's not a good thing. And at, at the end, like if you're a tenant, just pay your rent or find a way mm-hmm. to help to, to to come up with an agreement that you can actually mm-hmm. live with. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're a landowner or if you're a landlord or a property manager, same way. Like the more you can work together to come up with a solution, mm-hmm. the better it's going to be for everybody. And so. That's pretty much it for the podcast. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff. Again, the keyword documentation, uh, and these are things that um, I that uh, we don't you don't really think about initially when you're getting into a relationship with a property manager because uh, you're thinking more about you know keeping tenants as opposed to evicting them. Um, but this is a major step. It does come up, and I've learned it happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, it's something you want to uh, keep in mind as you as you move forward with investing. So so talk to your property manager um, and uh, it's, it's make sure it's something that they uh, they have processes and systems for that document. They need to know how to do this because the mm-hmm. last thing you can do is be afraid of this process. Mm-hmm. If you're afraid mm-hmm. of this process and you it keeps you from um, creating a, a, an eviction process and going through it, you're gonna. I, I've heard so many horror stories mm-hmm. of people that owned ten own, owned um, properties or mm-hmm. owned rental properties, and this is where they really yep. end up losing big Absolutely. time. Absolutely. So the quicker you can get in this process, and the quicker you can stop more damages from happening, mm-hmm. or the quicker you can stop the bleeding from not getting paid for rent the better. And again, every state's going to be different. There's going to be some states where they, they can get the right attorney and they can stretch these things out, mm-hmm. you know, months and months and months. Yeah. Every state's a little different. I, we are lucky to live in Northwest Indiana, which is still probably more of the, on the conservative side for sure when it mm-hmm. comes and on the um, on the landlord friendly side still, mm-hmm. I believe when it comes to this. Um, but as you mentioned already, there are some other areas that are already trying to create laws that are going to be very anti um landlord. So uh, just one more uh, tidbit to throw on there and talking with the property manager, because the natural question is, well, how long does all this take? So uh, for the whole whole process. So so in talking with them, once the 10 day letter is done, that is the key domino, the first one. You have to go through this. If you wait, it's it, the clock doesn't start. So mm-hmm. uh, you have to put that 10 day letter on. Once that happens, uh, for, typically in our market, it's taking us three to four weeks to go through the eviction. 
Yeah. So, so like if you look at dates, so for instance, mm-hmm. we talked about the 9th as a date. Mm-hmm. So the 9th or the 19th, and then we are saying on the 19th or 20th, we're telling the attorney. And normally the attorney is in court the next week. Mm-hmm. So it's normally, it doesn't take very long to mm-hmm. get these in court. Again, like I said, they may not have court like the week of the 25th right. of December. Sure, sure. So that might get pushed off a little bit. But for the most part, that's when court's happening. And mm-hmm. like you said, if they do side with the landlord, during that week of the 24th, 25th, 26th, normally by the first week or like as I said, the latest, the second week of the following month um, is, again, that's what our experience yeah. is. I can't tell you what your state or even your county, um, which may be a little bit different, mm-hmm. um, but I'm just telling you that's what our experience is. And what I have talked to many other landlords, I know, for instance, my friends in Virginia, like it's a very similar process, a very mm-hmm. similar timeline in Virginia mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. well. Yeah, Again, yeah, yeah, it could be different in California. It could yeah, be different absolutely. in Seattle. It could be different in New York. Way different in New York. Just don't buy rentals in New York. Um, <laughs> I think it's actually the worst state in the country to buy rentals. That's just my opinion. Uh, but anyways, um, you might have a little quicker. There, I mean, I have heard honestly of a couple instances where it was a little quicker. I don't know if the people were just embellishing or if that was actually that's not, true. That's not possible. But I mean, it is possible. I mean, I, mean, I, <laughs> I'm I not, could it's definitely not say, to embellish. yeah, that's not <laughs> I mean, I know some states are only five day letters. So like if it's uh, late yeah. on the first, second and you can put a five day letter on the fifth, it's possible to actually get in court by like the 15th or 20th. Hmm. Maybe you're saving a week or so mm-hmm. um, when it comes to this whole process. I don't know, but I don't think you could really even save more than a week. Sure. Maybe two if it's like, just some crazy, mm-hmm. um, but I do like li- owning rentals in Indiana because um, I do believe that it's fair. It's a fair process on both sides. Well, throughout this whole podcast, we've talked about what we do. All this stuff is what's happening in our market. So we do build rental portfolios for investors, uh, and uh, we do it on a daily basis. And so we'll actually be sending out a, a turnkey list uh, to our buyers today. If you'd like to be on that list and get our deals, you can email me at jared at or you can go to our web suit, web, website. Excuse me. Our website. Uh, web uh, no, a, don't go there. Web website. <laughs> That's great, Jared. Uh, yeah, Tom we should get you a web suit. <laughs> I, I could wear that like, like Spider-Man. <laughs> I could do that. Uh, so uh, back to the show. Uh, uh, but if you'd, uh, you can also go to uh, our website, buyolsongroup.com. Or WebSuit. Mm-hmm. Okay. Tom, Tom's going to remember this and use this. And it's okay. <laughs> it's We're great. just here for your entertainment. This is the bloopers reel. It's already started. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so so uh, thank you for joining us on this podcast. We really appreciate your time. And hopefully you learned something about evictions. Turn, what is this? Active Turnkey Podcast. <laughs> Active turnkey, the best way to buy rentals. (laughs) Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Olson Group Network makes no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in this podcast. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only, and any reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done at your own risk. This podcast should not be considered professional advice. Unless specifically stated otherwise, Olson Group Network does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast, and information from this podcast should not be referenced in any way to imply such approval or endorsement. Any third party materials or content of any third party site referenced in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions, standards, or policies of Olson Group Network. Olson Group Network assumes no responsibility or liability for the accuracy or completeness of the content contained in third-party materials or on third-party sites referenced in this podcast or the compliance with the applicable laws of such materials and or links referenced herein.